Glory. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Well, I'm glad to be in the house of God again today. If it was up to me, I'd be in the house of God every day, but I'm in as much as I can be. I'm um, just glad to be here, honor Pastor Mike, appreciate what he does and how he's carried this ministry along and the wonderful things he's done and all the books that he wrote. I enjoy looking at all of his books. It's always fun when I'm able to come down. Well, let's pray before we get going here. Father, I thank you in the name of Jesus that you are able to do all things, Father, that through faith in your name, anything is possible. So God, we, we extend our faith today. We stretch out our arms today, God, calling upon your name, your, the only name, the only name that can do anything, the name of Jesus. God, let our hearts be open. Let our, our ears be open. Let us create hunger. Lord, those that aren't hungry, help them get hungry today, that they can receive from your word. God, that we need it so desperately. We need to eat our spiritual food. Father, give that to us today through your word. Fill the hungry heart, touch the, the, the hurting, Lord, heal the sick, help the broken, give freedom, uh, freedom to those that need deliverance, God. And we just honor you, we give you glory, Lord, we ha hand over this time to you, God, we dedicate this to you, it's your church, it's your, your people, it's your body, so God, do what you want to do today, and we just ask for your blessing, in the name of Jesus, and if you agree with that, you could say amen. Amen. Well, without further ado, let's jump right into this. Turn with me to Luke chapter 18, verses 7 and 8. Verses 7 and 8. And shall not God avenge his own elect, which cry day and night unto him, though he bear long with them? I tell you, he will avenge them speedily. Nevertheless, when the Son of Man comes, shall he find faith on the earth? That's kind of what I want to talk about this morning is what Jesus is saying here. Shall he find faith on earth? It's an interesting thought. I mean, we know there's millions of people that believe in God all across the world and hundreds of denominations and groups that many people say they believe in God. So, why would Jesus say, shall he find faith, when we know there's all these people that say they believe in God? It doesn't really make sense. But as you dig into it deeper, you can unpack, which we're going to do this morning, a little bit more into what Jesus actually meant. When Jesus said, shall he find faith, he was talking about more than do you just believe in God. More than do you even believe in Jesus. He was, I believe, taking it even a step farther. In Mark 11, chapter 22, Jesus says, Have faith in God. Have faith in God. But do you know, it means more than just a simple belief in God. Really what Jesus was saying was, Have faith in God's word. Have faith in God's word. And I believe that's what Jesus meant when he said, will he find faith when he returns? I believe he was referring to those that believe not only in him and Jesus, but believe in the very words in his Bible, in his word. God is looking for people that actually will believe the word. Believe the word. So it cuts the numbers down from masses of people. It starts to shrink a little bit. When you get down to who really believes the word. In James 2.19, James was dealing with people um, that they had a belief in God, but their, their lifestyle didn't really demonstrate it. And he kind of, I think out of some frustration, he said, the devils believe and tremble. Because he said, you believe in God, well, so do the devils and they tremble. It was kind of like James was taking a little shot at people that maybe weren't really living right or they... They, they said they believed, but their, their, uh, their life and their confession didn't match. So again, we see there that James was addressing it. The devils believe and tremble. It was kind of almost, uh, I don't want to say sarcastic thing, but he was taking a little bit of a shot. He wanted people to know that it's more than just believing in God, even just believing in Jesus. Jesus wants us to believe 
in his word. Amen. And that's where the difference lies. My, my last seven or eight years of faith wasn't just believing in God and just believing in Jesus. It was believing and hanging on every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God coming from his word. And that really can decide the, the, the direction or, or the path of the believer is going to be based upon their faith in, in not just God or Jesus, but his word. The word is what gives us life. The word, it says in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. So when Jesus said, have faith in God, or in, uh, he was saying, have faith in not just God, but his word. Amen. Let me show you an example. Uh, in Mark chapter 9, we have a man that's desperate to get healing for a, a child. Let me read you the story. Mark chapter 9, verse 16. You'll see it here, Jesus uh, explaining a little bit more of what he meant. Mark chapter 9, verse 16. Uh, and he asked the scribes, what questions do you have with them? And one of the multitude answered and said, Master, I brought... Unto thee, my son, which has a dumb spirit. Wherever he takes him, he tears him, and he foams and gnashes his teeth, and he pines away. And I spoke to your disciples, but they couldn't cast him out. He answered and said, O faithless generation, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I suffer you? Bring him unto me. And they brought him unto him, and when he saw him, straight away the spirit tore him, and he fell on the ground and wallowed foaming. And he asked his father, how long ago since this came upon him? And he said, of a child, oftentimes cast him in the fire and into the waters to destroy him. But if you can do anything, have compassion on us and help us. Verse 23, Jesus said to him, if you can believe, all things are possible to him that believe. And straight away the father cried out and said with tears, Lord, I believe. Help me with my unbelief. And when Jesus saw the people come running together, he rebuked the foul spirit, saying to him, Thou dumb and deaf spirit, I charge thee, come out of him and enter no more in him. And the spirit cried, ripping him sore, and he came out of him. And he looked as one dead, and many thought he was dead. But Jesus took him by the hand, lifted him up, and he arose. You see, what happened here, Jesus was approached when the man said, if you can do anything. And that's where Jesus stopped. And Jesus' response was, not if I can do it, but if you can believe. That's what I want you to see here is the man came desperate, but Jesus had to almost bring correction to the way that he was thinking. He comes to Jesus saying, if you can do it. And Jesus replies, not so much if, but if you can believe, all things are possible to him that believe. And I love the way that the man answers, I believe, Lord, help me with my unbelief. Many times I've approached God that same way. Lord, I believe, but I need help in the areas I have unbelief. Can you help me like you did the man in this story? And God gladly does. But we can see there that Jesus is, is very strong in the area of not so much can I do anything. God can do anything. As he said, anything is possible with God. So the ball lies more in our court. Can we believe God for that thing that we want him to do? And that comes down to more than just believing in God, more than just believing in Jesus the things that we need in our life are going to be found in the Word. I heard somebody say one time, a pastor or something I heard, where they said, if you can find it in the Bible, you can have it. And I've always remembered that, and it makes sense to me more and more as I've been growing in Christ that I can have anything that, that I can grab a hold of out of this Word. So God's just not an automatic overdrive where all things just come to all believers. You just believe in God and everything just poured out and done. It's not that way. It's, it's we have to search the scripture. We have to grab a hold of what Jesus did, what we could see that was done and what's available to us, and we can grab a hold of it. Amen. So it's not a matter of if Jesus can do it. It's a matter of can we believe? And I know in the body of Christ, there's a struggle with faith. 
Many people don't really believe the things of the word. You can read certain things out of this book to people that say they believe in God and their eyes go cross and they're like, what? What are you saying? And we're going to look at some more of that as we go along here. But faith has always been a struggle. There's always been men that had a hard time, that battled, that wrestled with things. We see Thomas in the book of John. This is after Jesus died and rose. John, uh, Thomas was struggling with the fact that I don't believe. He basically was saying, I don't believe that Jesus is risen. Because he appeared to many people and the word was getting out that Jesus is alive. Jesus is alive. But we'll see what Thomas says here. Turn with me to John chapter 20, verse uh, 24. But Thomas, one of the twelve, was not with them when Jesus came. The other disciples therefore said unto him, We have seen the Lord. But he said unto them, Except I shall see in his hands the print of the nails, and put my finger into the print of the nails, and thrust my hand in his side, I will not believe. And after eight days again his disciples were with him, and Thomas was there. And Jesus came, the doors being shut, standing in the midst, saying, Peace be to you. Then he said to Thomas, Reach your finger and behold my hands, and reach your, your hand and thrust it in my side. Be not faithless, but believe. And Thomas answered, said unto him, My Lord, my God. And Jesus said unto him, Thomas, because you've seen and you have believed, but blessed are they that have not seen and yet believe. So we see even one of Jesus' disciples that was with him and watched the, the miracles and the things Jesus did still struggled with unbelief. Even after all that, you think your faith would be so charged up that you could believe anything. But even Thomas had some struggles with it. I won't believe unless I can put my finger in Jesus' hands and jam my hand into his side. And Jesus did honor it, but I'm sure when Thomas be, said, my Lord, my God, he was, he was hurt that, that he was so without faith. And Jesus said, be not faithless, but believe. And I, that's what I, I understand the Lord today wants us to grow in our faith. I, I believe he wants us to go farther than we've ever been. I like to see myself as I'm going farther in the faith than the last seven and eight years. I'm not the same place in faith that I was even a year ago, even a week ago. But I've had these times of doubting like Thomas. I've been just like Thomas. Well, I don't know if I believe. How many times have you heard people say stuff like that? Miracles break out. Well, I don't know if they were ever really sick. Devils get cast out. Well, I don't know if I really believe that. You begin to find that there is such a plague of unbelief in the body of Christ. It's, it's horrible. I mean... Not to pick on people, but we have entire groups and denominations that don't really believe anything in the Bible. They pushed out almost all these things that, that we have here. So it's not that God's not doing anything today. It's the fact that we don't believe. Just like uh, he said to the man, not that I can't do it. The problem is you don't believe. So we have to realize God is only doing what we believe him to do. God's never doing more than what we believe. You'll find that in the lives of believers. People that don't believe in healing, how can they get healed? People that don't believe in deliverance, how can they get delivered? We can't have what we don't believe in. And now we all have to work on that. It's not to condemn anybody. But the message is to challenge you and provoke you to a greater place of faith, which means a greater place of believing. We're not talking about just believing in God. We're not talking about accepting Jesus as your Lord. Many people have done that, but now it's time to move forward. It, 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 you've maybe heard the expression, it's time to go into, into deeper water. And that's what God's calling us to in this hour. He, he wants to draw us out to the deeper things of God. Now let's look at some of the disciples that had faith. And this is interesting to me, and I believe you find it interesting. You know, not all of the disciples walked in the same level of faith. You might not have known that. Maybe you thought all 12 were the same. You know, Judas messed up, then you're down to the 11. Maybe they're all the same, but it wasn't that way at all. They actually, each disciple, like it is today, each man has a measure of faith 
The disciples all had different measures of faith as well. And I want you to see that. Turning to Matthew chapter 16, we're going to talk about Peter for a second. And this will challenge you and provoke you to figure out where do you fall in this spectrum of people with faith. And in a second here, you'll see what I mean. Matthew chapter 16, verse 13 and 19. When Jesus came to the coast of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, saying, Who do men say that I am? And they said, Some say that thou art John the Baptist, some Elijah, others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. He said unto them, But who do you say that I am? Verse 16, And Simon Peter answered and said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered and said to him, Blessed art thou, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood have not revealed that to thee, but my Father which is in heaven. And I say unto thee that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I'll build my church, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. And I'll give unto thee the keys of the kingdom of heaven. And whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth will be loose in heaven. Do you see how Peter, even at that moment with the disciples, is quick to jump out in faith? You're the son of the living God. You are the Christ. He didn't even hesitate. You can already begin to see there's something different about Peter's faith than, than some of the other disciples. They were all kind of coming along at different paces. And that's the way the church is today. Uh, even me and, and you, we all are coming along at different paces. Everybody has a limit of where their faith can take them. Everybody has a breaking point in their faith. Everybody has a roof on that, on that house of faith where they can't go any farther. So we all need to step out. and We all need to, to, to grow and, and reach for the greater things. Anytime I've stepped out in faith, God has always met me there. Some of the best moments I've ever had as a Christian were the most uncomfortable, nervous, scary types of things. And they were the, the greatest blessings came from it. But I had to stretch my faith. Now, notice here in Matthew, Jesus even renames Peter. I'm sorry. He goes from Cephas. He says, you will be Peter. Peter actually means rock. And he says that I'll build my church on this rock. So Jesus was highlighting Peter, and I believe part of that was because of his faith, because of Peter's faith. It probably could have been anybody, but Jesus saw Peter had a more radical faith. Peter was quick to just believe God, and Peter didn't ask the questions all the time. Like a lot of people probably ask Jesus, just like they do today. There's all these questions, and really the questions are unbelief. Their unbelief. Peter didn't do that. In Galatians, Paul talks about uh, Peter and John. He calls them pillars in the church. In Galatians chapter 2, verse 7 and 9, you'll see where Paul is acknowledged them, acknowledging them as pillars of the church. So you begin to see that these certain disciples were set out, were set apart more so than some of the others. As a, as a matter of fact, you could say, how many disciples can you name? You probably can only name four or five. You don't even know the names of the other ones. Why? There's not much written about them. You honestly, there's not really anything said. And the reason is, the ones that had the greatest faith in God and his word, they went the farthest. The ones that believed Jesus word for word, they were the ones that he used the most. Not that God didn't love them equally, he did. And he would have given them equally in the blessings, but it was only obtained by their faith. In Galatians 2, uh, 7 and 9, you see Paul talking about when they saw that the gospel of the uncircumcision was committed to me as the gospel of the circumcision was given to Peter. For he wrought effectually in Peter to the apostleship of the circumcision and to me, Toward the Gentiles. So Paul was saying he was seeing Peter as the lead disciple. And he says it there that Peter was given the apostleship to the circum uh, circumcision. So Paul even, even knew that Peter, there was something special about Peter. And, I'm, and I'm, I'm tying it into this that I believe it simply came down to his raw faith. He believed 
God. And he didn't ask a lot of questions. He just said, God, if it says it, I believe it and I'll do it. And that's what we need today. That's where your miracle and your blessing and your provision and your, your breakthrough and your encounter, it lies in the fact, can you just believe God's word and not argue with it and not wrestle with it? Now, this gets even deeper now. Going to chapter uh, Mark, chapter 5, this is very interesting. You'll begin to see that those that had faith, even amongst Jesus' inner circle, were able to be a part of and see some things that the others weren't. You might not have ever noticed this, but look at Mark chapter 5, verse 21 to 24. And when Jesus passed over again by the ship unto the other side, much people gathered unto him, and he was nigh unto the sea. And behold, there became one of the, or come one of the rulers of the synagogue, Jairus by name. And when he saw him, he fell at his feet. He besought him greatly, saying, My little daughter, lie at the point of death. I pray thee, come and lay your hands on her, that she will be healed, and she will live. And Jesus went with him, and much people followed him and thronged him. Now the story picks back up in verse 35. While he yet spoke, there came from the ruler of the synagogue's house certain which said, The daughter is dead. Why trouble the master any more? And as soon as Jesus heard the word that was spoken, he said unto the ruler of the synagogue, Be not afraid, only believe. Now look at this verse, verse 37. And he suffered no man to follow him except Peter, James, and John. Peter, James, and John. All of the disciples are there in the previous verses. But when it gets, when they're almost at the house, Jesus stops and says, I can only take Peter, James and John with me. You have to realize that what what do you think the reason was? Peter, James and John? What was special about them? That he that they were able to go. They had the faith to go into these deeper realms and levels that Jesus was about to do. Jesus was about to raise the dead. A dead girl. Jesus is about to go in, but he couldn't have a room full of unbelief. Even his own disciples, some of them, he had to tell them, you got to wait outside. You don't have the faith right now to even be in this atmosphere where the dead's about to be raised. And this is something I've been pondering on a lot, which kind of produces this sort of message. Like, would I be, would, when Jesus is here ready to do something, would I be a Peter, James, and John? Or would I be a Thomas or, or someone else that can't believe it? And that just, I wrestle with that. I say, God, I refuse to be the one that can't come in the room. I, I refuse to be the one, God, that, that, that you won't allow in the room when you're going to raise the dead. I want to be a Peter, James, and John. But we have to see that even in Jesus' inner circle, not everybody witnessed everything. And it even goes farther than that. Raising the dead wasn't the end of it. But you have to see that Peter, James, and John had a different type of faith than some of the other disciples or some of the other followers of Jesus. They had a more raw faith. They really, really believed in the words of Jesus. Now look at this, Matthew chapter 17. With this type of message, it begins to have you think, where do you fall in this fold? Where is your faith when it comes to these type of things? And your faith can be grown. You could get more hungry. You could get more desperate. You, you don't have to stay or remain in the place that you are. But let's look at another one. Matthew 17, verses 1 to 9. This is called the Mount of Transfiguration. After six days, Jesus take Peter, James, and John, his brother, and bring them up to a high mountain apart. And he was transfigured before them, and his face did shine as the sun, and his remnant was white as light. And behold, there appeared unto them Moses and Elijah talking with Jesus. Then answered Peter and said unto Jesus, Lord, is it good for us to be here? If, if thou will, let us make three tabernacles, one for you and, and for thee and for Moses and Elijah. While he yet spoke, behold, a bright cloud overshadowed them, and be, behold, a voice out of the cloud 
said, This is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. Hear him. And when the disciples heard it, they fell on their face and were afraid. Jesus came and touched them and said, Arise, be not afraid. And when they lifted up their eyes, they saw no man except Jesus. And when they came down from the mountain, Jesus charged them, saying, Tell this vision to no man until the Son of Man be risen from the dead. So not only was it just Peter, James, and John when Jesus raised the little girl from the dead, now on the Mount of Transfiguration with this amazing miracle that took place, Jesus like takes on his heavenly glory again for a moment. And he's like, why? And, and Elijah and Moses are there standing with him, having a conversation on the top of this mountain. But only Peter, James, and John were there. Why? The other disciples couldn't handle it. They really just couldn't handle it. These things were too radical for even some of Jesus' own disciples. Some of Jesus' own disciples couldn't handle some of the things Jesus did. It was too much for them. And that's exactly the way it is today. Many of the things that God, many of the miracles that God wants to do, it's actually just too much for people. They just can't handle it. Their faith just can't handle it. So you have Peter, James, and John. They're the only ones there when Jesus raises the dead. Why? The others couldn't handle it. It was beyond their faith. What Jesus was doing was beyond their faith. Now at the Mount of Transfiguration, only Peter, James, and John. Why? The others couldn't handle it. They couldn't handle Jesus turning into a ball of light, having a conversation with Moses, having Elijah standing there talking with him. Hearing the voice of God say, this is my son, who I'm well pleased. They couldn't handle it. Why? They weren't yet at that place of faith where God could do these greater things in them. They were still wrestling. You know, many of Jesus' disciples weren't even sure if he was even the son of God for a while. It took them a long time to really be convinced. They were always asking Jesus, Jesus, just show us the Father. We'll be, you know, we'll be satisfied. They, they, they were wrestling with the fact that they really weren't even sure most of the time if Jesus really was who he said he was. But when you begin to see this, that there is a difference, that can God take you into the deeper place? Can, can you handle the more uh, powerful moves of God? Or would you have to wait outside? Would Jesus say, you, you can't come? You, you don't have what it takes you can't handle this type of intense thing. And that's what I've been pondering on. I believe it's something worthwhile for you to ponder on as well. That's why you see Peter stuck out kind of early on. He jumps out. You are the Christ, Lord. No questions asked. Another thing with Peter. Turn with me to Matthew chapter 14. You begin to connect these dots throughout the Word of God where you'll see certain people were standing out because of their type of the faith that they had. Not everyone had the same level of faith, and it's like that today. And what happens is over hundreds of years, the faith becomes so weak. Like we have churches now where they really don't believe anything in the Bible. They don't believe most of the things I'm going to read to you even today. But Matthew chapter 14, verse 22 Straight away, Jesus constrained his disciples to get into a ship and to go before him unto the other side while he sent the multitudes away. And when he had sent the multitudes away, he went into a mountain apart to pray. And when evening was come, he was there alone. But the ship was now in the midst of the sea, tossed with the waves, for the wind was contrary. And in the fourth watch of the night, Jesus went unto them, walking on the sea. And when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were troubled, saying, It's a spirit. And they cried out for fear. But straightway Jesus spoke unto them, saying, Be of good cheer, it is I. Be not afraid. And look at verse 28. Look who jumps out and is ready to do something wild here. And Peter answered him and said, Lord, if it be you, let me come out on the water. You see, Peter again here, is he, his faith is farther ahead than some of the other disciples. Peter had a greater faith in the things of God, in, the, in Jesus himself. 
And Jesus says, come. And when Peter was come out of the ship, he walked on the water to go with Jesus. But when he saw the winds, he was afraid, beginning to sink. He cried, saying, Lord, save me. And immediately Jesus stretched forth his hand and called him and said unto him, O thou of little faith, when did you doubt? Even Peter. Peter probably had most faith out of all of them. And Jesus still even says, oh, you of little faith, when did you doubt? Peter had the faith to walk on water. But as he began to doubt, he began to sink. But still, you see Peter standing out again here. No other disciple walked on the water. There's no other uh, record of anybody else walking on water. But do you realize that anybody could have walked on water? Any of the other 11 disciples or the other 12 disciples could have walked on water. But only Peter had the faith to say, Jesus, if it's you, let me come out. And he just went right out and began to walk on the water. So you see that any of the disciples could have walked on water. It didn't have to be just Peter. But Peter was the only one with the faith to do it. The other disciples weren't getting out of the boat. They're like, go ahead, Peter. We're staying right here. You go ahead on the water. And Peter began to walk on the water. But you have to understand, there wasn't anything special about Peter, for se, but he had, he had great faith. Peter had great faith, which allowed him and caused him to be places that other people weren't. Think about that in your own life. Our faith, the way that we believe in God and his word, will either put us somewhere where the blessing is or when the miracle is, or it will keep us from it. Now that is a reality. That is a thought to chew on. The way we believe this word, the way that we, we really grab a hold of it, will either put us where God is moving, or it will keep us away from it. Oh, my goodness. Now all I know is I don't want to be kept out. I want to be like a Peter, James, and John. I don't want Jesus to tell me, Colin, you have to wait outside. I'm about to do miracles. I'm like, no, I want to come in. Show me, teach me. Look at John chapter 16, verse 12. So we have to hunger and position ourselves. Otherwise, there are people that will miss out on what Jesus is doing because they don't have the faith. They can't handle it. They don't have the faith. Jesus can't even invite them in. They just can't handle it. Look at what it says in John 16, verse 12. This is Jesus speaking. I have yet many things to tell you but you can't handle them now. What? I have many things to tell you, but you can't bear them. This is Jesus talking to his disciples. He wanted to do more in their lives. He wanted to put more into their hands, but they couldn't handle it. Wow. Jesus himself said, there's more I want to do. There's many things I want to say to you, but you can't bear them now. You can't handle them now. You're unable to receive these deeper things. Paul dealt with the same thing in 1 Corinthians chapter 3. Look at what Paul says. It's the exact same comparison to what Jesus said. 1 Corinthians chapter 3. And I, brethren, could not speak unto you as spiritual, but only as carnal even as babies in Jesus. I have fed you with milk and not with meat, because you weren't able to handle it. Neither are you now able to handle it. Oh, my goodness. Paul is telling the church, you have, are not able to handle much more than just believing in Jesus. When are you going to begin to move forward? Basically, that's what Paul's saying. You were not able to bear it, and neither now are you yet able. But that's up to the individual believer. We, have, we take that responsibility on ourselves. Do we believe God? Do we, are we ready to go into the deeper things? Will God bring us in when miracles are happening? Will he bring us into the inner, inner room? Can we handle the more intense things of God? Or would Jesus be saying to us, you're unable to bear it? Let me look at a couple situations to see to test out where is your faith do you believe do you believe what God's doing and saying I want you to follow this and look just as like a little tester to see in Acts 
chapter 9. This was Paul's conversion. Acts chapter 9, verses 3 to 7. Let me read this for you quickly. And as he journeyed, he came near Damascus, and, and suddenly there shined out a, a light from heaven. And he fell to the earth and heard a voice saying, Saul, Saul, why persecute me? And he said, Who art thou, Lord? And he said, I'm Jesus, whom thou persecute. Is it hard for thee to uh, kick against the pricks? And he, trembling and astonished, said, Lord, what is it you'll have me do? And the Lord said to him, Arise and go into the city. It shall be told thee what thou must do. And the men which journeyed with him stood speechless, hearing a voice, but seeing no man. Can you imagine if someone comes into the church and says, Jesus appeared to me like light. I was struck to the ground and went instantly blind. And as I was laying there, a voice began to speak, and everybody there heard it. And then I went, and another man laid hands on me, and my eyes were open. And then I was filled with the Holy Ghost. That's Paul's testimony. But if that man came into church today, wherever you go, and he came and wanted to share that testimony, and he came to the front of the church, and he said, my name's Paul. I had an encounter with God. I was blind because it was so bright. I literally went blind. I was blind for three days. I heard God's audible voice speak to me and give me directions. And then my eyes were opened by another person through laying of hands. And now I can see. And here I am to share that with you. Do you think you'd believe that? You wouldn't believe that. Most of the Christians in the world would not believe that type of story. No, 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 there's something wrong with that guy. There's no way, I mean, th th there's no way that that really happened. But yet, that's exactly what happened to Paul. And if Paul came into church today, that would be his testimony. A light appeared, struck him with blindness, and a voice audibly that all the people around Paul could hear it began to speak. That's the same God. God said, I don't change. It's the same yesterday today and forever. But do you see that you could ask somebody, do you believe God's word? Oh yeah, I believe every word in it. But when you begin to open it up and unpack it, the story begins to change a little bit for people. Let me look at another one. Imagine if someone came into the church and gave a testimony like that. People would, nobody would believe it. No, no way. This guy, there's something wrong with this guy. What in the world's he saying? Go to Matthew 27. Verses 50 to 53. Jesus, when he cried again with a loud voice, gave up his spirit. And behold, the veil of the temple was ripped in two from the top to the bottom, and the earth did quake, and the rocks did rip. And the graves were opened, and many bodies of the saints which slept arose. And after that, they, they went into the city and appeared unto many. When Jesus died on the cross, men came out of the ground. The saints of God came out of the ground and began to walk around the city, appearing to people. Do you believe that? You say you believe in God, you believe in Jesus. Do you believe that when Jesus died... Men came out of the ground and began to walk. But if something like that happened today, you would shut that down right away and say, well, that's not God. God doesn't do stuff like that. That can't be. That's some other kind of thing. Yet yeah, that was the very thing that happened when he died. The men came out of the graves, appearing to many. Do you see how these stories actually begin to challenge your faith? When you begin to look at what, and, and this stuff still could be happening. God's not changing. There's nothing different about when Jesus was here and now. And the disciples, it's exactly the same. Nothing's changed. Nothing's gone away. It's just like it was then as it is now. Let's look at another one. And the reason that I'm reading you these stories is it, it reveals that you don't have as much faith as you thought you have. You thought your faith in God was strong and in Jesus, but when you begin to contemplate these stories, it challenges you. It challenges you. John chapter 9, verses 6. 
So you have to ask yourself, do you really believe? Because this is what will take you forward in the things of God, or this is what will hold you back. Only to the level of your faith is Jesus going to be able to take you into his word. Only as far as you believe can Jesus take you. Many people, like Paul said, they get stuck. They believe in God, they believe in Jesus, and now they're stuck. Paul said, I'd love to take you into these deeper things, but you weren't ready and you still aren't ready. So we need to be ready. We need to, we need to be more pliable, malleable to the things of God, believing in God's word. Because God's not impressed if you just believe in him. That does not impress God. Jesus hopes that you do receive him as Lord, but that's not what he's really, he wants you to believe in his word. Not just in his name only, but in his word. Remember what it says in Timothy about the last days. There'll be a church that will have the form of godliness, but denying the power. And it says, from such turn away. That's a dangerous place to be. A form of godliness, but denying the power. No, we need to accept the things of God and what his word says it means. But look at John chapter 9, verse 6. And when he had thus spoken, he spat on the ground. Let me, well, let me back it up here. Jesus passed by, verse 1. He saw a man which was blind from birth. His disciples asked him, saying, Master, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Jesus said, Neither sin, but let the works of God could be made manifest in him. And when he thus spoken, he spat on the ground and made clay of the spittle and anointed the eyes of the blind man with the clay. And then said to him, Go and wash in the pool of Siloam. And he went his way and washed and came seeing. Do you realize Jesus spit on the ground, making clay out of the dirt. He spit and made a clay-like substance from the ground and then anointed the eyes of the blind man with the clay. Literally, Jesus spit on the ground, made a clay-like substance, and stuck it into the eyes of the blind man. And it didn't get healed instantly. He said, now go wash at this pool down the road. Do you realize that blind man had to have the faith to walk down the road still blind with the dirt and clay from Jesus' spit on his eyes? It wasn't until he washed that his eyes opened. It says he came seeing. He didn't leave seeing. He walked out of there still blind, but now with dirt and, and, and spit on his eyes. This is done by the Jesus that you believe in. He's the one that did that. But yet anything even close to that today, people would be up in arms. The religious people would go nuts if something like were that. If somebody came in here and spit on the ground and made a little ball of clay and pushed it in someone's face, they'd call you a lunatic, a heretic. They'd say this is of the devil. But yet this is exactly what Jesus did. Do you believe that Jesus did that? Do you believe that he spit on the ground? made clay, rubbed it in a man's face, and then sent him down the street to wash, to be healed. He did it. He did it. Let's look at another one in Acts chapter 8. I'm purposely challenging your faith, because I you can read these stories to people that say they believe in God, and their eyes get big. Really? That's in the Bible? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, and a lot more than that. Oh, yeah. But remember, God can only do in you to the extent that you believe. You can't give or do anything more in your life until you believe. The more you believe, the more Jesus can come, the more he can do for you. Let's look at this other one. Acts chapter 8. This is the story with Philip where God tells him to go preach. Acts chapter 8, verse 29. Then the spirit said to Philip, go over and join yourself to this chariot. And Philip ran to him and heard him read the prophet Isaiah and said, understand what you read. And he said, how can I except a man should guide me? And he desired Philip that he would come up and sit with him. <clears throat> the place of the scripture which he read was this. He was led as a sheep to the slaughter and like a lamb dumb before his shearer, so he opened not his mouth. In his humiliation, his judgment was taken away. 
Who shall declare his generation? For his life is taken from the earth. And the eunuch answered Philip and said, I pray thee of whom thou speak about this prophet of himself or some other man. Verse 35, then Philip opened his mouth and began at the same scripture and preached unto him Jesus. And as they went their way, they came unto certain water. And the eunuch said, see, here is water. What stops me from being baptized? Philip said, if you believe with all your heart, you can. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the son of God. And he commanded the chariot to stand still, and they went down both in the water, both Philip and the eunuch, and he baptized them. Now, verse 39, this is what I want you to see. And when they were come up out of the water, the spirit of the Lord caught away Philip, that the eunuch saw him no more, and he went on his way rejoicing. And Philip was found at Azotus, and passing through, he preached in all the cities till he came to Caesarea. Philip was transported. Philip was translated. God picked him up and supernaturally moved him, like teleport, teleported him to another place. Do you believe that? Do you believe that God can do that? You know, this is after Jesus is gone. He's, he's, he's with the Father. Now these, deci these disciples and, and Philip and these other, these evangelists are out doing the work of the ministry. They're preaching. And he goes in this story, and the Bible records that when he came out of the water, Philip was gone. God translated Philip to another area. Do you believe that? Do you believe that God can teleport people from one place to another? I would bet that most Christians don't believe that. So that's why I'm giving you these stories to see, do you, do you believe that these things are, can be done? And that's what separates now from the types of disciples just like today. If you're having a hard time believing these things, you're right now in a position where God wouldn't be, Jesus wouldn't be able to bring you into that inner room. He only brought Peter, James, and John. The others couldn't come in. Why? They weren't ready for it. They couldn't handle it. Now, you don't have to stay that way. God wants to move you forward. He wants to, to be able to, to come into that inner room, to see the dead raised, to see the Mount of Transfiguration, to walk on water, to believe in these other miraculous events. The church of Jesus Christ without the supernatural begins to dry up. It begins to dry up. And you see that out in this world today. There is some dry religious stuff out there. And the reason is they, they stop believing in the Bible. They stop believing in the things of God. Jesus always said, have faith in God. The last thing I want to share with you, and this is to encourage you to, and myself, I preach to myself, it's time for me to step it up. It's time for me to really believe. It's time for me to become more like a Peter, James, and John. But we know in Mark chapter 6, when Jesus went to his hometown, you see that this is the easiest example to really see what happens when there's no faith, what the results are when the people can't believe. When they struggle in their faith. Mark chapter 6. This is when Jesus goes to his hometown. And he went out and came to his own country. And his disciples followed him. When the Sabbath day was come. He began to teach in the church. And many hearing him were astonished. Saying from what wisdom is given this man. That does such mighty works. Isn't this the carpenter. The son of Mary. The brother of James. Of Judah. Simon. Are not his sisters here. Jesus said. It says they were offended at Jesus. But Jesus said, a prophet's not without honor, but in his own country and among his own kin and in his own house. And he could there do no mighty work except lay hands on a few sick people and heal them. And he marveled because of their unbelief. I want to finish with that. Jesus could not do any mighty work in those that didn't believe. Those that didn't believe. That puts this back on us. Jesus could not do any mighty works to those that didn't believe. It's the exact same today. For God to do mighty works in your life, for God to show up in mighty supernatural ways, for you to be in that inner chamber when the dead are raised, or on that mountain when the supernatural takes place, it's going to come down to do you, you believe. Do you believe the word of God? Don't become this victim like his hometown. He could do no mighty works because of their unbelief. Unbelief.
will literally kill you. Unbelief will dry you up. Believe in God's word. Step out. Reach for something you've never reached for. Don't stay stagnant. Don't dry up. Stretching your faith is what keeps you alive in this walk with Jesus. That's what keeps me alive every day, going a little farther, believing for a little more, stretching out a little more. Don't let unbelief stop what Jesus really wants to do in your life. Let me pray for you. Father, I thank you in the name of Jesus. As your word goes out, Lord, meet everyone where they're at, Father. Encourage us today through your word, Lord. Let our faith be strengthened. Let us become more like Peter, James, and John, Lord. Let us be the ones that you call into that inner chamber when you're raising the dead. Let us be the ones, Lord, that you call up onto that high mountain to show your marvelous glory, Lord, to be translated before us, God. Let us be invited into these wonderful things, into the deeper places. Help us all reach out and walk farther. Take us all out into the deeper water, Lord. Let us shut down and break down all the hindrances. and We cast down every unbelief, Lord. We even repent of it. Forgive me for my own unbelief, Father that I can, I can be forgiven of that, Lord. Let us go farther, Lord. Call us out, Lord. Call us out into the deeper water. And I just pray this in Jesus' name, amen.